You know, one of the things I love about Forever Family is you really see just how normal these children are. I think people get an idea of what a child in foster care is like, and they don't realize they're just, they're just kids. And this is not their fault that they're trapped in a situation. And so you have a story, I think, about a sibling group that was in your home and then was freed for adoption. Can you talk a little bit yeah, about that? I, um, that? That story reminded me of them. I had three boys. Um, as they were born, they came into care. So they didn't come to me all at once. But as each one was born, they added to our family. and. And so the brothers were together. And because they came into care at different times, different case plans, they were free for adoption at different times. And the, the oldest child was adopted when he was three and a half by a family in New York. And they had met the other two children also and had said, you know, let us know if, if these boys are going to be, you know, free. We'd like to keep them together. When the second child was free for adoption, they adopted him. But he didn't settle like the older child did. Uh, he kept wanting to, he called me Granny, he kept wanting to see Granny, and, and he wanted to see his younger brother. He was just having very, very difficult behaviors. <clears throat> the family was concerned. And when the third child came free for adoption, they actually waited a couple months because they were trying to get the second boy settled in. Finally, they just said, you know what, we can't wait any longer, we've got to bring him home. So they did, they adopted the third child, brought him to their home, I took him out to New York, and when he got there, the second child immediately started settling. Mm -hmm. It was like, we need to be together again. Something's wrong, you know? And we had noticed that his, his middle child's behavior was more difficult when the older brother left, but couldn't put our finger on why, just kind of put it up to being two. Hmm. But the time the third child was with him, uh, I spoke with him last week, the boys are settled in and doing well. They're five, four, and almost three at this point. Wow. That's a big handful for anybody it to is. take on. It, yes, is. it is. It is. But, but it shows how important that bond and attachment between those children are. That when they were separated from one another, it was difficult for them to function. Yeah, I wanted to jump in on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, with our children, they experience trauma, but they can't necessarily tell you this is how I feel and that I feel scared mm -hmm. and I feel hurt and I'm sad. So they communicate through their behavior, especially with little guys, mm -hmm. you know, they're not able to say, I'm struggling, but they will show you that they're struggling. And even as young as these boys were, they are so closely connected to each other that when a part of them was missing, they showed you through their behavior. And when they came back together, they were able to, to, to settle, as she said, and, mm -hmm. and just adjust and, and, and be okay. That sibling is really their port in a storm, Absolutely. right? That's their piece of security that they get to hang on to. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, Sue and I were talking before we came on camera, too, that there's a, a phrase in foster care that I think is very valuable for everyone in our listening audience to hear, and it's just being there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when a family can just be there for children in cases like this, and sometimes it's just listening, sometimes it's just holding, sometimes it's la allowing a child to cry mm -hmm. and just let them cry without questioning, without consequences, without <coughs> behavior modification, mm -hmm. but just let the child cry. And in a case like this, this little boy not only needed to be someone to be there, but he needed his brother to be there for him, too. Cause I, I still can't even imagine the trauma a child goes through of being taken away from their family and then separated from their own siblings. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to be there for them, and we need to do all we can to keep those siblings together. Mm -hmm. And if there are people out in the community that are only able to offer one bed, for instance, mm -hmm. providers in the community are willing to network parents up that have the siblings so that mm -hmm. the foster parents although they not, may not be from the same house of worship or may not be biological family members, if you have two licensed foster parents, they are able to allow the siblings to see each other frequently, which that even is helpful. Um, there are so many of the siblings that Natalie mentioned that are in care that don't see their, their siblings but once a month, every other month. I mean, it is so challenging within the system of care for these siblings to have regular visits. So if foster parents can step up and help with that, it makes all the difference in keeping the bond going for the children. As foster parents, we can set up uh, um, just a, we're all going to go to Monkey Joe's mm -hmm. or we're all going to meet at a such and such a water park or whatever. And the children can be with one another even though they're not in the same home. So it, it is important that 
that they keep that connection even though we, we realistically they can't always be placed together I mean it's just it's the way it is we know in South Florida you know a two-bedroom condo may be the extent of you know the, the size of the family home but that shouldn't discourage someone from saying at least I'm open to serving children in foster care and respecting the sibling relationship and making sure that I get to monkey Joe's at least once you know every couple of weeks so that everybody can see each other talk about the timing because we were saying you know I have an eight-year-old and I'm feeling like you know on the one hand this should be the right time in my life for me to do this because I have a child in the home on the other hand I, I honestly I get a little overwhelmed by my child some days so when is the right time I think you have a lot of different experiences yeah. here. My opinion is the right time is when you just feel that you're called to do this. Mm -hmm. And you're not always equipped when you're called, but you can be equipped as you're called. And it could be for one child, it could be sibling groups, but when you're ready and you have the support of what ChildNet provides, what the providers like kids, Kid provides, what 4Kids provides, we can help a family through difficult times and we can allow you, to, whether you're a Empty nesters, I think, are a great time. That's mm -hmm. actually when my wife and I first decided to get involved in this whole arena, is when our son moved out. So we were ready. We had bedrooms, we had an opportunity, we had time, so we were ready. But not everyone's the same. Folks with eight-year-olds are sometimes feeling like they're ready, others are not, and that's okay. We want to make sure the family truly feels they're called to do this and they're ready to do this, and, and then the support comes around them. Yeah, my husband and I had six children. Um, when we started fostering, we had one 15-year-old still living at home. Our, um, I think we had one in college, actually, at that point. But we ended up adopting four more, so we were fostering while we had our, our adopted children at home. Um, you just have to, you have to know in your heart that this is it, and then you just have to step out and say, okay, um, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And like Tom said, there's always people there, ChildNet, our agencies, your friends and family. Right. You know, there's people you can call on to help you. I find people all the time saying, you know, you're amazing. And I'm like, I'm not amazing. I'm just being a mom. You know, yeah. just it's just a normal, ordinary mm -hmm. thing. Yes, these kids have cat challenges, but they're just kids. They just want somebody to love them and care for them and be there, be there for them. That's what they want. They want somebody to be there for them. And speaking of that, uh, how about the Foster Parent Association? Mm -hmm. Want to talk a little bit about that? Foster Parent Association um, meets on the fourth Tuesday of, of each month at Plantation Community Church on West Broward Boulevard, 6501 West Broward Boulevard. Um, it's an awesome resource. Mm -hmm. You meet with other people. We have trainings. People come in and talk about different issues, different things that you may need to know as a foster parent. But y there's also an opportunity to network to talk with other foster parents, to say, hey, this is happening, help me out. Um, I think that's one of the greatest benefits, just that ability to talk with other people who have been there and know what you're, what you're dealing with and to get ideas from them. You know, my husband and I have been doing this 23 and a half years. We still get good ideas from people. You know, there's always somebody that's done something or has been there that can give you an idea. And lest anybody feel put out that it's at a church that's not a religious. It is not a religious. Thing. They are simply allowing us space to meet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We serve pizza starting at 6.30, $2 a person, $10 for however many of you are in your family. Mm -hmm. And the meeting starts at 7. And there's child care. And child mm -hmm. care. I guess very good thing. It does it's everybody child has children. You do have to <laughs> call send uh, an advance. email to mm -hmm. um, info at info at fapa.org. I'm sorry. That's all right. Oh, that's good. In order to request child care. I think it's so important to have authentic um, peer support, people who are actually doing the hard work. I can come forward and I can talk about the need for children in foster care, but I'm not a foster or adoptive parent yet. I say yet. I will, I will do it. When I am that empty nester, I'm not there yet. And that question about the right time is such a personal one. But um, I think it's also important to stress that um, Unfortunately, this need is not going anywhere, and many times people will hear about the need for foster and adoptive parents and maybe not really act on it until a year or two years later um, when they've thought about it and it keeps coming back to them. So uh, whenever it's the right time for the family, and even throughout the training process, it's still an opportunity for you to keep deciding, is this the right time? Is the right time for myself, the members in my household, um, and, and we'll be here when you're ready. Once you get licensed as a foster parent, how long does that last? 
There's an annual relicensure where you have to do some paperwork, but it lasts as long as the organization works with you and you're willing to stick with it. Uh, we do ask to make sure that you're active, uh, making sure you're taking children in. We don't want people just holding on to a license, and, uh, but, but most importantly is it's up to that person, that family, when they're ready to take a break for whatever reason. My wife and I took a break. We've been doing this for many years when our granddaughter was born, but uh, we're looking at where she is now. She's four years old, so we're ready to step in again, and this conversation is making it very difficult for me not to say we're ready to step in. <laughs> <up. laughs> yes. Sign me Let's up Let's do the again. paperwork. Let's go. Uh, we're, we, you know, there are people in the community that are, that are thinking about whether or not they should do it or mm -hmm. want more information. The beginning step is to call the number that's provided mm -hmm. and then speak to someone regarding what the whole process is. A lot of people that come to our orientations say, well, if I knew this was all that was involved, I would have done this two mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. But they just didn't because there were a lot of unknowns and they never took that next step of getting the information. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are so many children, siblings, teens that need loving, nurturing homes you know, please make the call and get the extra information. That was actually the very perfect way to end this. Thank you so much for <laughs> saying all of that. Mm -hmm. If you have been touched by the stories of these children, if you've been moved by the importance of keeping brothers and sisters together when possible, and you think that you can provide the home that they need, please don't hesitate. Contact ChildNet at 954-414-6001. Or visit Forever Family at www.foreverfamily.org. Whether as a foster or adoptive parent, the impact you will have made on these children's lives will be immeasurable. I want to thank Natalie Gomes, Diana Lake, Sue Redfern, and Tom Lukasik for their insight on this subject. I've been your host, Cindy Arenberg seltzer President and CEO of the Children's Services Council of Broward County, where our mission is to empower Broward's children to become responsible, productive adults capable of realizing their full potential, their hopes, and their dreams. For copies of this program or any other episode of Future First, please call the Children's Services Council at 954-377-1000 or visit www.cscbroward.org. I hope you like us on Facebook and remember to join us next time on Future First, Focus on Broward's Children. Thank you.